Hello, my name is Sohela Zibari and I'm the host of the podcast A Myth of My Own, where ancient Persian myths and personal stories come to life. A podcast of spoken and unspoken words. An auditory invitation to taste, to smell, to feel, and to own a dream or two. A place to share myths of our own. Hi there. Welcome to the third installment of the OWL series on my podcast, A Myth of My Own. Those who are listening to my podcast or reading my uh, stories on Sohela's, uh, SohelaWrites.com, they know that I am in the process of writing a mythological story based on ancient Persian fables and stories, which goes back, way back before Zoroastra, Zoroastra times and maybe 5,000 years ago. Um, my, uh, the, the reason I'm having this uh, program, since my uh, protagonist and character in my story is a female, I saw it fit to discuss a little bit uh, uh, the, the female characters in mythology, not just Persian mythology, uh, but other uh, countries and other cultures mythology. And I started with this program I started with the Greek mythology, since most of the people are more familiar with Greek mythology in Western world. And to do so, uh, I invited, um, and, and before, I invi uh, uh, before I invite uh, my uh, friend into the discussion, uh, I thought that it's very important to uh, look at the, uh, these characters from the female point of view. Since uh, for centuries, only men did these stories. And we hear about all those psychologies and characteristics from the male point of view. But in recent years, uh, because of the explosion of the female writers and poets and playwrights and screen, uh, and and screenplay writers, the notion of the female characters has changed drastically. And it, it's, it has a big contrast uh, with all those stories we read in our uh, uh, history books or mythological books or uh, in our literary works. So I saw it fit to have my friend, very good friend, a teacher, a poet, a storyteller, and human and humanist, Miss Judith Remy Lader. So we were in the same class. Yes. And we clicked. We did indeed. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is a privilege to have you here, really, because I I like you. Uh, as I understand, you were a teacher, right? Yes. For Thirty years. Why don't you tell about yourself and how you go about the writings and what uh, what uh, uh, inspired you to be a poet, or is it instinctual? Or no, it's you... not instinctual. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, go ahead, tell us well, about first yourself. Of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. It oh. really is an honor. Thank you. Thank honor you. is mine. Um, your your the title of of your uh, website, a myth of my own. Um, impressed me and I thought to myself, do I know where my myths are coming from? So my, my experience uh, is very different from yours. I have never been to Persia. <laughs> um, I have not too often been outside the United States, but I have, I have not only the myths of the United States, but also the myths of Ireland, which I uh, got from my, my mom and um, my family. And um, I, I spent a long time in the convent, so I have those myths of the, the, uh, the Middle Ages in my head. <laughs> and um, I have a great deal of interest in, uh, in the Odyssey, not the Iliad, which I think is just heavy and horrible. That's my prejudice. Yeah. But okay. I love the story part of the Odyssey. And so 
for about the last 20 years, I've been playing around with different characters, female characters, in the Odyssey. And I, I get my inspiration from reading what Homer has written. And then I think to myself, hmm, what would these women have said now that Odysseus is saying, this is what has happened, and it's very, very one-sided. So what I'm trying to do, I, I think my, one of my basic myths is a kind of transformation. I mean, I have been spending seven, over 75 years on transforming myself into my best self. And so I'm, I try to transform these women into um, personalities that people would understand. Mm -hmm. That's what I try to do. So that's what I'm doing with the Greek material. I see. Well, the, the thing is, as we know that uh, those characters, that it's uh, been written in many, many, it not just, it's not exclusive to the Greek characters. No, no, no. A uh, lot of different people, they present them in the different, depending on the centuries that right. they are written about. Right. So you, basically, it is good to have a writer that implements, uh, first of all, is a female writer and right. poet, and implements our century's uh, ideas of how a female uh, heroine should be, or or the or or was uh, or was right. yeah or was. It's a, it's basically part of it is a hindsight. Right. Part of it is our wishes, our uh, our uh, ideas, our our philosophy. And when we learn about the literature of the past, so often it is male-centric and very interesting. But the women characters, even the noble women characters, tend to become sidelined and they disappear. So you hear about them a little bit and then they're gone and the man is on to his adventures. So it's nice to bring forward a possible personality of a woman who encountered um, an adventurer from the past. Yeah, that's the, the interesting thing is about, about exactly about the male um, point of view about these things that we've been reading in the schools, we've been bombarded in the, the, for centuries right. with these stories, and we heard it, but it was one-sided. Even the Persian mythology, is that, that so? uh, yeah, even though women in Persian mythology are a little bit more, um, it's a little bit different. Um, uh, than uh, Greeks, uh, Persian used to uh, actually in uh, the old Persian, they we had like women warriors and right. things. Uh, but still, uh, but still, they there is a certain characteristics that uh, the male writers they keep it uh, as as their own idea of what a, a heroine should be, right. what a female character should be. Um, Sometimes they, even with the, even if when they are diabolical, even when they are submissive, even the, they are like a, a, a very sub, a, a very loyal, it's totally different than what we are seeing in the female writers right. and their notion of how a heroine should be because, in the stories. Because we experience femininity in a way that men can't, right. and therefore when a woman is presented to us we are able to place ourselves into that consciousness, or at least attempt to place ourselves into the consciousness and present it to the world in, in the best and most vivid way, because the men are not inclined to do that. So, some men, but not many. So then uh, you, you, I've read some of your uh, poetry. Yes. Uh, I, I have to confess. Well, because <laughs> Some of the vocabularies you use, uh, I, I have to look up. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't be, don't be. English is my second language, and I really appreciate that the, the usage of those vocabularies it yes. enriches my vocabulary when I read your poetry. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they are beautiful. I've read them. They are gorgeous, and. Um, I looked into some familiarity or similarity with the Persian characters in right. the characters you're depicting. So I went and did a little bit of research on those uh, poems that we chose, right. like, uh, uh, and uh, I tried to compare them with the uh, wow. with the Persian characters and if there are any similarities or closeness. In a in, in a way, there is a lot of similarities, right. but. 
I, I never liked the mythology when I was in the school, um, although we learned them from the elementary. But they taught us, you know, the, the, especially Ferdowsi, which is the great, like it's the Homer of Iran. Right. So, uh, but uh, I still, I, I'm still learning about them. But what interests me is that because I'm writing this um, this uh, story myself, I want to see what other female poets and writers do with these characters. Okay. So I, that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> That's okay. why you're here. And I loved your poems. Some of them are long. Uh, some right. of them are long. Uh, but you, uh, you had um, three characters that uh, we read uh, from you. One of them is uh, Kirke. 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 Tell, tell us about Kirke. All right. First of all, I'll warn the audience. I have cut them down because they are long and they're pretty talky. And I have tried to eliminate some of the harder words. Um, <laughs> But, uh, I've, no, I like the harder I've, words. I've, I've retained the, the, the heart of the poem. Um, Kirke is a goddess. And um, those of you who have read the Odyssey may remember that Odysseus went to Troy because there was a big war. And everybody left after 10 years. And he offended the gods and therefore um, was punished. And he had to travel for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And one of the islands that he lands on is the island of Kirke, oh, okay. also known as Circe. Yes, most yes, of us yes. know her as Circe. So um, this is my poem about Kirke. <clears throat> From the island of the hawk, I, nymph, enchantress, Roman soft of tongue, call me Circe, but I am Kirke, hard in name and in nature. My island a remnant of the mountain building process. I of the golden cresses am succubus, magic maker. I can transform those I meet as easily as I turned Picus to a woodpecker and beautiful Scylla to a monster with six dog heads. Potions are my mischief. Odysseus piggish sailors imagined themselves as swine, grunting, rooting, lapping up slop. Inbred with nightshade, my little physic made them hallucinate, but they knew what was happening, a double whammy. You cannot say I was anything but good to Odysseus. I had him join me in my fabulous palace. I unhexed his men, made them taller and more handsome than before their piggy interlude. I made Odysseus forget his wife and gave him sons. Did I bewitch him? Who knows? I never held him against his will. I called forth the breeze that made his departure from me possible. I warned him about the wild challenges he would face. I gave him directions to the underworld. I loved him enough to let him go. Oh my God, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to capture um, both the, the power of Kirke to charm uh, people who come to her island, but also the love she had for Odysseus, which isn't really presented so much in, in the Odyssey. I see. Um, Odysseus thinks that he, he feels trapped by her, but she enables him. She allows him to, to, to leave the island. And I, I think she's, she's a winning character. I like her a lot. So that's in your, you know, when, when you read the uh, actual story, she is evil. Yes. She, she turns people to pit. Well, she does turn people to pigs because they irritate her. And, oh. and I have been known to want to turn people to pigs. <laughs> I, I sympathize. I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, is, it the, is the island called the Serpent Island? I don't know if that's what it's called. I don't know. I, I, I have to look it up. Yeah, I, so do I, obviously. You know, it's just uh, because uh, the serpent is a very big thing in right. most mythologies. And, right. And and, uh, uh, and connection of the serpent and the female, it's very interesting. You see them in the Bible, you see them in, in the Persian, uh, all big, big in the Persian, right. either in the form of actual serpent, uh, the, 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 the snake, or the uh, dragons, or, you know. Kind of large you know, snake yeah, so, with legs. So anyway, I have to look up, yes. and maybe, maybe our, uh, our audience, our audience can, 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 look, can look up. You know, thank God for Google. 
So, so anyways, then, uh, then he, he, uh, Odyssey is married. Oh, Odysseus is married. No, uh, yes, he's yeah, married Odysseus to Penelope. Odysseus is married to yes. Penelope. And she's waiting. Uh, she's waiting. Okay, yeah. we get to her later. Yes, maybe we will but get to her. Maybe you we have, uh, actually, although we, we are talking about the female characters, um, Kirke is, is a goddess, right? Right. But you have a um, poem about a sailor that who falls, falls in, victim to, victim her. to uh, right. her spell. When they land on the island, they're starving, and uh, they decide that they need to kill something to eat in order to stay alive. And they see smoke coming up from the center of the island. And so this is about the encounter of one of Odysseus's men. Not all of them go to seek, uh, right. seek who right. is on the island. Right. But he's part of this group. He is a sailor. And so he goes seeking um, whoever is burning flesh at the middle of the island. So that's what, this is called the sailor who turned into a pig. Okay. Because I wanted to, I wanted to think about how that sailor might have regarded him being transformed by, uh, by Circe or Kirke. So, hunger, sharp as pain, thorny as a needle in the eye, twists every man's gut. Famished or not, we must find the source of the smoke coiling like a serpent far off at the center of the island. Then we see Circe sitting at her loom and singing. She has barley cakes, goat's milk cheese, goblets of amber honey mixed with preomnian wine. A fat roast, a roast goat dances at the table tempting us. Slush, slop, slosh, wine courses through my gullet. Slicks oil sluices from the table. My body balloons, stretches hugely. And then I fly through the room, drawn by every luscious scent. I am drawn by the redolence of the golden-haired woman. My ears fall into my eyes. The world turns dark. I smell as once I saw. I turn to speak, but my words are grunts. My mates grunt softly, too. I am born like some devil belched forth by a cherub. She of the golden hair herds us, sated, into a sty, pig slop all around. My tail is tightly curled with happiness. I cool my warty skin by wallowing in the mud. Again, I hear the song of the banquet chairs. Come eat, come eat, come eat, come eat. <coughs> of course, it is a pig call. I slowly melt into the poison of ignorance and blinkered vision. Then Circe strikes me with her wand. Presto changeo, I morph back into my man's self, but better. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's why I liked it, because when I read the, the story, the yes. original one, uh, so uh, in terms of um, for Turkey to uh, capture Odysseus for her, you know, for, you know, just uh, keep him for right. him. So he, she turned him back to the human beings, she but did. even better. They were better. Even better. They were brighter and cleaner and better. You know, I like to. I, you know what I like to look at this story. You, you look at the story differently. I like to say, this is the. This is what women can do to a man to change him. They can change him to a pig if they want. <laughs> they can change him to a better man. Yes. Younger. And maybe and both. Better. And or maybe both. <laughs> Just for his good experience. You know, so, so this is my input, you know, kind of a modern input. You know? and, and is there anything in Persian um, stories like this? Are there, are there women who have capacity to transform people? Uh, I haven't uh, encountered anyone. That's interesting. Uh, but, uh, but I know uh, there are, um, actually, there is um, the story of a um, lady called Manigé. Actually, I have the picture on my um, uh, my book, and what uh, she was the daughter of the enemy of uh, Bijan, who was from the uh, from Iran uh, from Persia, and this uh, woman uh, uh, fall in love with the enemy's uh, mm. uh, prince. Right. So Manigé, what she, he does, as far as the poisoning goes, 
issues, you know, like uh, he, she fall in love with him because he strays into her territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, she takes him, takes him to the garden, uh, the beautiful area. Right. And she poisons she doesn't poison him. She puts him to sleep. Yes. And take him to her palace. Ah. And seduces she, him. Seduces him. <laughs> but uh, for three, four days, she keeps him in the palace until her father finds out that she has the enemy, the prince, right. with her. So it's a long story. Yeah. I'm not going to make right. everybody But it has know. some similarities. Some similarity that if, if a woman wants a man, and they don't stop at nothing. And, you know, <laughs> so right. that's that's as right. close as I can get. But again, I'm not that well versed. Right, in, you're still uh, studying. Yeah, I'm just. Uh, it's a learning process for me right now, and uh, I think yeah, there is the, and there is another character that uh, Sudabe that she uh, falls in love with the son of her husband, and she does all kind of things to seduce him, but he doesn't succumb. And that's another story. That's another story. Again, people can go yeah. and look at the female characters in Shahname, which means the Book of Kings, and look at the women's character in, uh, you know, look, look it up. There are many, many articles that are very worthy to look up. Right. But, you know, they're all in English, you know. So Well, it's good can... since so few of us read Farsi. Farsi, yeah. <laughs> Although, although I try to find the Farsi uh, text too, although I have the book, but this book I cannot use it. It's like a, very hard to use them. But I like to get the pieces of them, uh, yes. you know, in Farsi to see how uh, compare how they did in the translation. You right. know how, how, how true it is. How true it is to the translation. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yes, yeah. The 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 there are characters in many many uh, mythology that. There are uh, seductive women. Yeah, they're they powerful use, women. They're manipulative. Uh, uh, they are powerful, but still they need to use manipulation. manipulation yeah. you know? Interesting. Yeah. So, so this is this is about Syria, but also we have people like Pen Penelope, which is uh, which is which is very pious. It seems. Well, or she, she is pious. For Od Odios. Uh, do you, do you want me to do the Penelope one, or do we do we want to go to anything you I want? Think, but I think we'll go to the, my favorite, it, which is Euryclea, and I'm only going to read a tiny bit of it. Okay, it's, a very, okay. it's ten pages long, but uh, Euryclea was the nanny of Odysseus, and she was the one who raised him. She right. was in his in right. the position of his mother. She was the one who recognized him first when he returned. She helped to slay the maidens. I mean, everything she. Did for him, and she truly loved him. And this poem that I have written takes place when everyone except Euryclea has died. This is my fictional presentation of this character. Mm -hmm. And she's being interviewed by a handsome young man, and he he wants to find the dirt, mm -hmm. essentially. And so she speaks to him, and then uh, that's on one side of the page if you're reading poetry, and on the other side is what she's not saying, but what she has thought. OK, but before you yes. read the poem, uh, just for, for our audience to, to be clear that uh, what role, what, uh, after how long would those years come back to? It's 20 years. And he comes, he, com he doesn't come as himself. No. He disguises himself. He comes as a, um, as a poor man. Poor man. So why does he do that? He wants to know if Penelope was uh, if, faithful to if him. If Penelope was faithful for the forty years, and she was, and mm -hmm. he wants, he knows from another king that uh, the people in his land have been trying to seduce Penelope, and he wants to beat them up. Take revenge. Take revenge. Know. Yes. And after dilly dallying all over the world, yes, yes. And, um, Messing around with other That's gods, right. goddesses, and women, and yes, so yes. typical, <laughs> perhaps typical. <laughs> oh, we do have a character. Yes, actually, it's in Nezomi's um, uh, epic uh, Khosro and Shirin, that the king Khosro falls in love with Shirin. She, she's a princess. She's an Armenian princess, mm -hmm. and but and and make her fall in love with him, but. 
he dilly dallies. He doesn't, he does, you know. And but she stays faithful. Right. She stays. That's this a real is, Penelope yeah, character. This is really bad. And she, but she's her character is much stronger. This one I studied because I love Nizami. Nizami is one of my favorite epic right. writers, and he does only love stories. It's not like a war right. or there are wars and things, but it's a, basically the relationship with the men and women. And he's a feminist too, uh, sort of, uh, for 900, going back 900 years right. ago. Oh. From his passages, you see that how feminist he is. He, he really worships women. He loved his wife, but he, she died early, but that's another story. But uh, the thing is that uh, we have the same character, and Khosrow comes and goes back and forth, and he gets jealous when another man falls in love with Shireen and causes his death. And that's another story right. again. Hopefully right. I would be able to translate some of those passages for my readers. It's, it's, it's a great. long shot though. Okay. It's very hard for me to translate from Farsi to English. Yes. Neither languages I have, I'm an expert in, <laughs> just, just for you guys to know. <laughs> but, don't, but read my stories, it's not a deterrent though. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, we do have the same. This is, this is just the, a little bit. It's half a page. Yeah, so go ahead. And so he goes, uh, 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 the only person who recognizes Odysseus is, is Eurycleia. Okay. okay. So now it's, we it's go a to... really interesting poem, okay. but it is very long, and I'm sparing you. Okay, so this is in the, in the early part of the poem, poem, and she's talking to this young, young Greek man, and she says, The sacking of my home is still a wound that festers these long years later. The tall tree at which my tutor gave me lessons, the cistern, the earthen walls, the fields, all turned to ash before my eyes. And this is what she thinks. Red gold, orange, and purple, a volcanic eruption threatening wild conflagration. The aftermath, gray-white residue on hearth an altar, in furnace and oven, anywhere burnt offerings are made. Ash, the drifting remains of catastrophe, a cloud of powdered igneous rock floating in the wind that dances above the ground. From ash rises a firebird, feathers of copper, from nothing, something. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Uh, the nanny is that, uh, as I, we were saying that most of the characters, uh, the, the, what I realized in reading some of these uh, uh, stories, both in Persian and Greeks and other stories, most of these female characters are either goddesses or from royal family. Mm -hmm. You don't see any common character. Mm -hmm. Even the nanny is from the- She's uh, royal. She's royal. Although she's a servant, but she's a royal. She's from, captive. From, yeah. yeah. So, what uh, uh, the, the thing is today, when we write as female writers, we are going. We want to show what a woman goes through their life, and not every woman is from a prominent family. Right. Not a not every woman is wealthy. As a matter of fact, most women in the world, they go through many, many hardships. Right. And they have to put up with actual life. And you experience this through yes, your... through my work. Through my, that's why I call you a humanist. Because this work is a work that you work... Uh, just tell right. me about this work you're doing. When I retired, I decided that I needed to do something for the community. And mm -hmm. I found uh, an organization called Waymakers. And I volunteer for Waymakers uh, as a sexual abuse um, uh, victim's advocate. It's called SAVS. And um, my task is if a woman calls in, or a man calls in an attack, the police call the forensic nurse. The forensic mm -hmm. nurse calls someone like me. And uh, I go and I accompany the women along this bitter journey that they have, the forensic examination. And so when I'm finished with the women 
whom I grow in the three or four hours that I'm with them to care about them very deeply. And so I, I carefully, without identifying them, write poems about those I've met. Oh, yeah. And so I have a couple here if you want to hear them. Oh, I read them, and I think it's worth for my audience to hear them okay. because they are not the least. Right. These are these are real life yeah. journeys, and that and maybe someday myths will be written about these women. Right. This but first this one. This is the reality. Yeah. This is the reality. This first one is called Boulevard, and it's pretty rough uh, because the woman was in a very bad state. <clears throat> Shit. I hear the sound of zippers day in and day out, or, and a river of noise from the five freeway two blocks from my patch. Hot and sweaty in the south, uh, Southern California evening, my nylons rasp when my legs, fatter these days, rub against each other. What will the next trick hold for me? A rough John or a whiny one who asks me to ride him cowboy or gets off on butt fucking? After I'm well or ill shagged, I'm nothing more than hot, wet meat with no name. I hear zippers in my sleep. I want dreams that are not wet and a life where I'm not fucked. Yeah. That's a toughie. Yep. Yeah. This one is called At the Hospital, and it's about um, a little girl who has been assaulted. The woman holds her baby boy. He's the image of the fat angels in Renaissance paintings. His name is David, she says. All the muscles of her body tense with grief. I brought him because he cries when I'm not holding him. It was, she says, shuddering as her daughter dances across the multicolored carpet, moving like raindrops on a spring afternoon. It was her granduncle who did this to her. David sends up a loud cry. His slow eyed sister, skin as flawless as gold silk, is pleased to tell me that she calls her brother Poo Poo Head. Ah, the quixotic world of a three-year-old, I think. Maybe she doesn't remember what happened. The forensic nurse steps into the room. Your daughter is 35 and a half inches tall and 37 pounds. The exam revealed no obvious injury. The mother, like the Madonna and Michelangelo's Pieta, is a portrait of And this last one is called precarity. And I had to look up the word myself before I used it. I'll define it for you. It's politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer from failing social and economic networks. In other words, the people who are pushed to the side and live on the sidewalks. Okay. Sitting in this safe place, a homeless woman pushed away from a livable life on, onto the fractured edge victim of the politics of selfishness, failed by society, failed by gurus, failed into madness. I've been on the street for 24 years. I was 14 when I turned my first trick. All four of my kids went to the state. They had different fathers. They don't know me or each other. The youngest is a beauty, though. Freeing them, letting them float away from my darkness was the right thing to do, but hard. I dream about them. I want to be a doctor. I want to cure people like me. I think I was raped last night by a guy who's old enough to be my father. He swore he'd have my pussy. My saying no meant nothing. Maybe the man from downstairs fucked me too. Who knows? I was out of it. I can't remember when I haven't been out of it. She rages against who and what she is, brain damaged and mentally ill. She marches stiffly along a road few see and fewer acknowledge. We with our homes, our cars, our friends, our too much food on the table, how do we differ from her, bruised and sobbing in this safe place for rape victims? We make our way with the tools we have, and our tools are more and better. Who would we be with nothing, with no one? These are real stories. And to me, they are real heroines, because they go to a very harrowing situation, and they still survive. Thank you. Thank you.
But before we go, yes, you have two books published. I do. And you're in the process of publishing a new set of poetry. That's right. The Tiger Woman, you, uh, you published it in uh, 2012, uh, well, I think. 12 or 13. Yeah. And they are beautiful. Uh, it, it, some of them are short, it's precise. And I can see the evolution of your writing. Right. Especially with these last three poetry, poems that you sent me. It's not that these are gorgeous poems, but these are really haunting. And as I wrote to you before, I shouldn't use gorgeous, but they're gorgeous visually because you can find yourself in the place, in the streets, with them, uh, maybe getting raped. You can feel it. Yeah. Uh, the little girls, you know. And this happens all over. It's yes. not just here. And, um, and uh, I, I, I wish you a lot of luck for Thank your you. new, new for the series. New series. I'm yeah. looking forward to. Yes. Uh, and, uh, before, before, and also, you have uh, letters from Lithuania. Right. These are based on, uh, tell me about right. this. My husband and I um, spent uh, about nine months in Lithuania as uh, exchange teachers after right. we both had retired. And um, we were very lonely, and he wrote letters home. Uh, he wrote about, um, I think, 12 very long letters, and they were wonderful. They described the situation we were in. He's very funny. He's very witty. And so I edited them lightly, very lightly, and put them into a book. They're worth anybody's read, in my opinion, if you want to learn. And this is? That's my husband. That's yeah. Hans. No, yeah. No, neither of these. Oh, is neither my of these. Oh, That's I'm my sorry. This is your, this is your husband. That's Hans. right. Hans. It, Hans later. Hans later. And uh, it's a good read. Good. It's a very good read. And um, I don't want to get into all those um, uh, things, but uh, you found out because your husband was Jewish, right? Yes. And he said, uh, no one is going to know that I'm Jewish when we're there because they will clam up. Ah. And so, you know, here I am. Irish as the day is long, with the name Judith. Right. And uh, nobody thought that Hans, who looked very uh, non-Jewish, nobody thought that he was Jewish, but our, the woman who uh, was uh, our landlady said, uh, Judith is a Jewish name. Where did you get that name? And I said, um, well, my parents were Judith, Jewish. A big lie. Uh -huh. I know this much about Judaism. But I thought, you're not getting away with this. She turned like that and accused us of, of stealing from her. It was oh a God. really scary experience. Yeah. Well, the Lithuania is yes. known to be a little bit uh, anti-Semitic <laughs> anti country. Yes. <laughs> so yes. oh, we, we don't want to go that far. But, but that's an experience. That's it is experience, an experience, yeah. you know. Uh, so uh, and thank you so much. This was wonderful. That, Thank this you. was wonderful for me. Uh, yeah. I learned a lot through your uh, through your poems, and through your uh, and we we met before uh, right. we do this and we talked extensively. And we ate Persian food. We, we ate Persian food. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so, for this opportunity. Oh, so, hey, thank, thank you, you for the opportunity that you gave me, because my my purpose of this uh, podcast is uh, to inform without being too academic. Right. With being being ourselves, being our own selves as a, as a writer, as a poet, as a as any as a woman, as a woman, and I'm I'm very 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 honored to have you. And here. you are doing a wonderful job. I know that there are hundreds of women out there who are thanking you. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. And also, before I go, I want to thank Bambi here. She's our um, uh, editor. Yes. And uh, Baz, who is doing uh, this uh, video taking. Who is our charming uh, videographer. Which, which, in, in, which we met at Jack Green. <laughs> so, right, that's where we met. <laughs> yeah, right. That's where we met. So, so hur hurrah for Jack. Yes, yes, yes. This, this I can, uh, you know, attribute it to Jack. <laughs> so thank you very much for um, watching my podcast. I hope I can produce more of these uh, 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 videos 
and uh, be in touch. And female characters are not a myth. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>